Thoughts on Karma and Consciousness Published on January 1, 2015, by Carl Donk When people mention to me that karma is a bitch, I always reply by telling them that karma isn't a bitch. Karma is just very misunderstood. Saying that karma is a bitch is like saying that gravity is a bitch, because gravity can make us fall and hurt ourselves. But we know that gravity is just doing what gravity is supposed to do, and so we keep that in mind and try to be careful. If we trip and fall down and hurt ourselves, we don't blame gravity, we simply get up again and try to be more careful. Similarly, karma also does what karma is supposed to do, and that is maintaining balance of energy in the universe. A few years ago, I wrote a post where I explained how, what people refer to as karma probably works, based on what we know about electromagnetism. What we refer to as karma, is just the universe trying to maintain internal balance of energy. It doesn't make any distinction between concepts such as right or wrong, good or bad and positive or negative, those are labels that we put on things depending on how we perceive them and depending on our understanding of our reality. All the universe cares about is balance. So when you think that the universe is retaliating against someone's bad behavior, or that the universe is rewarding them for good behavior, this is an incorrect view of how things work. What's really happening is that balance is being restored. Nothing more, nothing less. In the aforementioned previous post I had already illustrated how this works, but I want to discuss a thought experiment below that also explains the same concept. Let's say we have a glass tank filled with water. The tank resembles our universe, and water resembles the energy in our universe. At the beginning of our experiment the water surface is calm and level, and there's balance. Now suppose we were to very quickly scoop out some water out of the middle of the tank, temporarily creating an empty hole on the surface of the water. What happens next is that the entire tank of water will automatically react and fill in the hole that was created in order to restore balance again in the tank. This illustrates the concept of karma and how the universe works. If there's a smaller concentration, or a lower quality etc., of energy anywhere in the universe, the whole universe will react to restore balance. Similarly, if there's a higher concentration, or higher quality etc., of energy anywhere in the universe, the whole universe will also react to restore balance. In the above experiment it's also important to note that the water surrounding the empty hole responds faster to restore balance compared to the rest of the tank. In a large enough tank you wouldn't notice much disturbance more to the edges if you didn't scoop out a lot of water from the middle. For example, if you had a very large tank and scooped out some water in the middle with a small spoon, you wouldn't notice much disturbance in the water close to the edges of the tank. However, the whole tank still responds to restore balance, it's just not, immediately, noticeable, as you get further away from the affected area. This also illustrates the interconnectedness of our entire universe, and the fact that changes happening anywhere in the universe can, and do, influence the universe as a whole, even if it may not always be noticeable, and even if it may take a while. This becomes easier to understand when you realize that our universe is a fractal system that is not only characterized by self-similarity, but also its interconnectedness. We also have to keep in mind, as previously explained, that the universe is a whole lot bigger than what we are able to observe with our senses, or detect with our technology, we live in a very small part of the big fractal system. So changes within the observable part of our universe can invoke a reaction from the unobservable part, like in broken symmetry, and the other way around. This means that when we talk about the law of conservation of energy for example, we have to take into account the whole universe, that is, conservation of energy is true for the entire universe, and not necessarily just the parts of it that we can observe with our senses, or detect with our technology. Now. The energy in our universe has been called many names, among which ether by Nikola Tesla, and Org 1 energy by Wilhelm Reich. 
but I think physicist Thomas W. Campbell is probably much closer to the truth when he says that the fundamental energy behind the universe is consciousness. Campbell explains why he thinks so in his book trilogy, My Big Theory of Everything. If there's matter in the universe, something has to drive this matter and tell it how to behave, give it life, that something is consciousness. This is similar to the virtual, gaming, worlds we are able to create today, which contain various objects that would do absolutely nothing at all if it weren't for the artificial intelligence, AI, that was programmed into the simulation, defining how those objects behave and interact with each other. Consciousness in our universe can be compared to the AI from our virtual worlds, but it's a lot more advanced. All the matter in our universe is driven by consciousness, down to even the smallest particle. After all, something has to tell even the smallest particle in our universe how to behave. In fact, not only is matter being driven by consciousness, but matter is also created by consciousness similar to how everything in our virtual reality worlds is constructed by the software running it. One of the important differences between consciousness and AI, at least at the current state of our technology, however, is the fact that there's a built-in feedback loop when it comes to consciousness as a result of its fractal nature. So not only does consciousness create our reality, but our reality can also reprogram consciousness. When particles come together and form a bigger object, that object is driven by the combined consciousness of those particles. When particles come together and form an organism, say a single cell, that cell is driven by the combined consciousness of all the matter that makes up that cell. Therefore, the consciousness of a human being is the combined consciousness of all the cells that make up that human being. Yes, our consciousness is not created by our brains, but by the combined processing power of every living cell in our body, comparable to a biological supercomputer with many trillions of nodes. This is where the holographic nature of the human body comes from, information processing and storage happens everywhere throughout the body. For example, our memories are, temporarily, stored in every living cell in our body, and not just the brain. Like a fractal, the consciousness of the universe is infinitely divided into smaller pieces of consciousness, all having their own individual experiences, while still being part of, and connected to, the whole. The famous physicist Erwin Schrödinger mentioned back in 1958 that the total number of minds in the universe is just one, and that their multiplicity is only apparent. When the spiritual teachers of our past mentioned that we're all one, they really were not kidding. The goal of consciousness is to create, to experience, to learn and to improve, or recreate, ultimately lowering its entropy as Campbell explains in his books. This explains why lust, the desire to experience, sits at the very core of consciousness. This also explains why the sexual drives are at the very core of consciousness, and consequently, all life in the universe, you can't create or recreate without the sexual drives. Dr. Sigmund Freud established the sexual desires, our natural sexual instincts, as the primary motivating forces of human life. Even Carl Jung came to a similar conclusion when he said that sexuality is of the greatest importance as the expression of the thonic spirit. Wilhelm Reich took Freud's research even further and defined sexual energy, which he later called orguan energy. Orguan comes from the word orgasm as the universal life force, the anti-entropic principle of the universe, a creative substratum present in all of nature. This means that consciousness creates order out of chaos, moving from higher to lower entropy. And it's no coincidence that people who are highly creative and intelligent are more in tune with their sexuality, are hornier etc. People who suffer from sexual repression and suppression are not as creative and intelligent as they could otherwise be. Like Wilhelm Reich said, quote, Sexual suppression supports the power of the church, which has sunk very deep roots into the exploited masses by means of sexual anxiety and guilt. It engenders timidity towards authority and binds children to their parents. This results in adult subservience to state authority and to capitalistic exploitation. It paralyzes the intellectual critical powers of the oppressed masses, 
because it consumes the greater part of biological energy. Finally, it paralyzes the resolute development of creative forces and renders impossible the achievement of all aspirations for human freedom. In this way the prevailing economic system, in which single individuals can easily rule entire masses, becomes rooted in the psychic structures of the oppressed themselves. By Wilhelm Rye. End quote. Rye also said that it is sexual energy which governs the structure of human thinking and feeling. So it's clear that the suppression or repression of our sexuality, one of the most fundamental and important parts of our consciousness, or universal life force, can only result in our stultification. For a perfect example of this, watch the video below to see the effects of sexual repression and suppression on the intellect of women. If we take a look again at the thought experiment I discussed above, then the water in the glass tank can be seen as consciousness that exists throughout the universe. And like I explained, if there's a lower quality of consciousness that exists somewhere in the universe, the whole universe will react to improve the situation and restore balance. This is why the information that was being spread by the movie, The Secret, a while back was very wrong. According to The Secret, the universe is governed by a natural law called the law of attraction, which is said to work by attracting into a person's life the experiences, situations, events, and people that match the frequency of the person's thoughts and feelings based on the concept of like attracts like. The secret encouraged people not to think about their problems, but to instead think about positive things that they wanted to attract into their lives. However, as I explained, quote, If there really is such a thing as the law of attraction, the fact that nature has clearly shown us that opposites attract each other means that according to the law of attraction, you should be thinking about your problems in order for the universe to respond with solutions. You should be dissatisfied with your status quo and let that be known to the universe in order for the universe to respond with things that can help to get you satisfied. If you pretend to be satisfied, happy and think positive, which is what they encourage you to do in the secret, the universe will respond by bringing negative things into your life. It's all about maintaining balance in nature. If you're leaning too much towards being dissatisfied and unhappy, the universe will try to get you more towards the side where you feel satisfied and happy. And the other way around. So the smart thing to do is to never be satisfied, think about your problems and deal with them in order for the universe to continue to respond with positive things in your life to help you improve. End quote. Many people today would rather pretend that all is well even when that's not the case. In fact, they often pretend to the outside world that things are going a lot better than they really are. If you just take a look at what people share on social media websites, you'd get the impression that everyone is probably having a blast 24-7 and are living a perfect life. The reality, of course, is different. Fooling your environment isn't going to help you improve. You have to let your environment know that you're in distress if you want it to respond to you in a helpful way. Similarly, if you want the universe to respond to you, you have to let it know with your entire being conscious and subconscious that you're having problems and are very dissatisfied. In other words, you have to be the hole in the water surface in the above thought experiment. The above thought experiment also explains why it appears that aliens are actively involved here on Earth trying to improve the quality of our consciousness. This was one of the topics explored in the documentary Thrive. Many people are wondering what would motivate aliens to do this and how this could possibly benefit them. Based on the above information about how the universe works, it's easy to see why aliens would want to help humankind to reach a higher quality of consciousness. If our low quality consciousness here on Earth is allowed to grow and spread, this could have a very negative impact on the consciousness in the rest of the universe in the long term, starting with our immediate neighborhood. So aliens living close to us in nearby star systems with a much higher quality of consciousness would understand that they had better try to help improve our quality of consciousness before it begins to impact them negatively given the interconnected nature of the universe. 
Right now we're like a bunch of savages, destroying our environment, constantly fighting with each other, and killing each other on a large scale. And we just began playing with powerful nuclear weapons, and are beginning to go out into space. If the quality of our consciousness doesn't improve, then our current low quality and barbaric state of consciousness is what we're going to be spreading soon throughout the universe at an exponential rate. So in a way the aliens are acting like a kind of immune system that's trying to do damage control before the damage spreads too far into the universe like a disease. The universe can be seen as a single organism. It's interesting to note that in the first Matrix movie, the character Agent Smith compared humankind to a virus. And to be honest, he had a point, and it wouldn't surprise me one bit if that's how the aliens see us right now. You may be asking yourself how it is that we ended up with such a low quality of consciousness. There's a lot of evidence pointing to the fact that life on Earth, and most certainly the human species, has experienced a lot of trauma in the past that needs to be healed. The Earth, viewed as a single organism, is very sick. Carl Sagan often remarked that right now, the Earth is an organism at war with itself. Life is killing and living off of other life. This can't be healthy, and it's difficult to accept that this is the natural order of the universe, as there's a lot of evidence pointing to the fact that at the most fundamental level, consciousness, or universal life force, as Wilhelm Reich called it, is programmed to be intrinsically good and in support of life. Somewhere in our past things went very wrong, and there's evidence pointing to outside tampering as the primary cause. Perhaps in the future, when the collective consciousness of the Earth has finally healed, we'll get to a point where not only humankind, but indeed all organisms will live together in peace and harmony on Earth. Footnotes Footnote 1. These ideas aren't as new as you may think. Biologist Rupert Sheldrake mentions the following in his paper Mind, Memory, and Archetype, Morphic Resonance, and the Collective Unconscious, published in Psychological Perspectives. Spring 1987 quote. English writer Samuel Butler, whose most important books on this theme were Life and Habit, 1878, and Unconscious Memory, 1881, contended that the whole of life involved inherent unconscious memory, habits, the instincts of animals, the way in which embryos develop, all reflected a basic principle of inherent memory within life. He even proposed that there must be an inherent memory in atoms, molecules, and crystals. End quote. And then there's also physicist Max Planck, the founder of quantum theory, who said the following, quoted in The Observer, the 25th of January 1931. Quote, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Everything that we talk about, everything that we regard as existing, postulates consciousness. End quote. Physicist Freeman Dyson also came to a similar conclusion. Quote, it is remarkable that mind enters into our awareness of nature on two separate levels. At the highest level, the level of human consciousness, our minds are somehow directly aware of the complicated flow of electrical and chemical patterns in our brains. At the lowest level, the level of single atoms and electrons, the mind of an observer is again involved in the description of events. Between lies the level of molecular biology, where mechanical models are adequate and mind appears to be irrelevant. But I, as a physicist, cannot help suspecting that there is a logical connection between the two ways in which mind appears in my universe. I cannot help thinking that our awareness of our own brains has something to do with the process which we call observation in atomic physics. That is to say, I think our consciousness is not just a passive epiphenomenon carried along by the chemical events in our brains, but is an active agent forcing the molecular complexes to make choices between one quantum state and another. In other words, mind is already inherent in every electron, and the processes of human consciousness differ only in degree, but not in kind from the processes of choice between quantum states, which we call chance, when they are made by electrons. End quote. 
Nobel Prize-winning physicist Eugene Wigner also made an interesting remark related to this. Quote, When the province of physical theory was extended to encompass microscopic phenomena, through the creation of quantum mechanics, the concept of consciousness came to the fore again. It was not possible to formulate the laws of quantum mechanics in a fully consistent way without reference to the consciousness. All that quantum mechanics purports to provide are probability connections between subsequent impressions, also called apperceptions, of the consciousness. And even though the dividing line between the observer, whose consciousness, is being affected, and the observed physical object can be shifted towards the one or the other to a considerable degree, it cannot be eliminated. It may be premature to believe that the present philosophy of quantum mechanics will remain a permanent feature of future physical theories. It will remain remarkable, in whatever way our future concepts may develop, that the very study of the external world led to the conclusion that the content of the consciousness is an ultimate reality. Remarks on the mind-body question, Eugene Wigner, in Wheeler and Zurek, P.169. End quote. Footnote 2. There is obviously only one alternative, namely the unification of minds or consciousnesses. Their multiplicity is only apparent, in truth there is only one mind. Erwin Schrödinger in Mind and Matter, 1958. Footnote 3. Carl Jung wrote in his book Memories, Dreams, Reflections, quote, It is a widespread error to imagine that I do not see the value of sexuality. On the contrary, it plays a large part in my psychology as an essential though not the sole expression of psychic wholeness. Sexuality is of the greatest importance as the expression of the thonic spirit. That spirit is the other face of God, the dark side of the God image. End quote. From Wikipedia. Quote. In analytical psychology, the term thonic was often used to describe the spirit of nature within, the unconscious earthly impulses of the self, that is one's material depths, however not necessarily with negative connotations. End quote. The thonic spirit, or spirit of nature within, is just another name for the energy behind the universe, which is consciousness, as explained above. So what Jung is really saying is that sexuality is of the greatest importance as the expression of consciousness. Based on this, what do you think happens with a person's consciousness and intellect when they are forced to suppress or even repress their sexuality? Footnote 4. According to witnesses interviewed by the Disclosure Project, UFOs are often seen near facilities around the world where nuclear weapons are stored. There are several accounts of UFOs actually disabling nuclear missile systems, with one account by Dr. Bob Jacobs involving a UFO, which was caught on film shooting a test missile with a dummy warhead out of the sky at Vandenberg Air Force Base in 1964. Watch the below episode of Larry King Life for more details. The aliens seem to be particularly concerned with our nuclear capabilities. And I think Wilhelm Rye had a pretty good idea why. Quote, From the historic Orono experiment of 1951, Rye knew that nuclear radioactivity had a deleterious effect upon the living sea of energy in which we all live. From the observations made of the reaction of a milligram of radium put inside an Org-1 energy accumulator, Wright knew that there was an antagonistic relationship between the energy of life, ether, prana, etc., and the man-made nuclear energy so recently unleashed upon the planet. The effect of the nuclear irritant seemed all out of proportion to the physical amount of radioactive material. The distance of this irritating and wildly exciting Org-1 antinuclear effect seemed to reach much farther than the actual radioactivity of the nuclear material would indicate. Perhaps, Rye reasoned, the Org-1 energy was a continuum, and this antinuclear reaction of the life energy extended and perpetuated itself in a chain reaction fashion far beyond the original limits of the nuclear radiation. End quote. That sounds a lot like what I explained above with the thought experiment. By detonating nuclear weapons here on Earth, we may be influencing the universe in a way we don't yet understand right now and that may have negative consequences, 
not only here on Earth, but also elsewhere in the universe. Footnote 5. A new consciousness is developing which sees the Earth as a single organism and recognizes that an organism at war with itself is doomed. We are one planet. One of the great revelations of the age of space exploration is the image of the Earth finite and lonely, somehow vulnerable, bearing the entire human species through the oceans of space and time. Carl Sagan Footnote 6 Ancient texts are full of stories of gods coming to Earth from space and causing a lot of mayhem. Humankind appears to be the result of a lot of genetic experimentation on the part of these gods, and they appear to have deliberately dumbed us down and made us weaker, first through our genes, and later through divide and conquer strategies, sexual suppression and repression, and various other antisocial constructs which they enforced upon us. They may even have genetically re-engineered other life forms to make them hostile towards each other and towards humans in order to make life more difficult, with evidence showing that at times they even unleashed viruses, plagues to wipe out parts of the human population. For details on this, please read the books The Gods of Eden by William Bramley and Slave Species of the Gods by Michael Tellinger. Consider that according to the Bible, Adam and Eve lived together in harmony with all animals on earth, right up to the moment when God decided to punish them, after which almost everything on earth turned itself against them and each other. Thank you for listening. This article was originally published on Carl Donk's blog at blog.carldonk.com. Remember to visit for regular updates. You can also find this content published on archive.org and lbry.tv. Remember to save a local copy of this video and any other content that you would like to continue to have access to in the future. You never know, those goddamn motherfuckers in big tech might censor this content in the future.